Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. It's good to be here on Horse Center. It's good to see you right there. Uh, we've got that big weekend at parks coming up. The Cotillion, the Pennsylvania Derby, grade ones, big stakes card. Yeah, big card. Uh, I'm interested to see how Guy does in the uh, in the dirt mile because I think he's one of the best horses in the country. And we'll see how he does stretching out to a mile again, see if he goes dirt mile route or Breeders' Cup sprint. Uh, we got a nice sprint race for three-year-olds, wide open uh, gallant bob stakes. But the two big ones, of course, are million-dollar races, grade one races, the cotillion stakes for the Phillies, and, of course, the Pennsylvania Derby for the males. Matt, you ready to jump into the Derby? Absolutely, Brian. Let's go. Here we go. Here's the field. Not 11 three-year-olds have uh, uh, entered this last real big race for three-year-olds before they have to face all their horses in the big races. And uh, some questions of who's going to be the favorite. On the outside, they named Bob Baffert's Reincarnate. Uh, Baffert, of course, didn't train Reincarnate for a first race, a few races while he was on the Derby Trail and in the Kentucky Derby, but now back with Baffert, he's one for one coming off a win in the Los Alamitos Derby. Yes, absolutely. It's and it's an interesting field of eleven. It's not a particularly distinguished field of eleven, Brian, but uh, kind of an evenly matched, interesting uh, group of three-year-olds. That there's only three horses in the field that are stakes winners of any kind. And two of them are grade three winners. So the entire field, somebody's going to get their first uh, grade one victory. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting mix of horses who have knocked around a little bit in stakes races, some more uh, uh, late comers to the scene. But Reincarnate's been around all year, Matt. Uh, ran well. He won the Sham Stakes early in the year. Ran pretty well at Arkansas. Uh, Kentucky Derby, I think we could draw a line through the Kentucky Derby because he was really involved in that very fast pace. And then uh, after a little layoff, he came back with a nice win in the uh, Los Al Derby, as I said, a couple months ago, beating Skinner, as most Bob Baffert horses do. He's working well for this Pennsylvania Derby. 11 hole, though, it's uh, it's an interesting spot for the morning line favorite. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And, uh, uh, you know, working well for the Pennsylvania Derby, that seems to be something that we've seen from Bob Baffert horses in the Pennsylvania Derby quite a few times recently. Baffert's going for his uh, fourth or fifth victory in the Pennsylvania Derby, and most of them have come uh, fairly recently, going back to Bayern, which was just about 10 years ago. But Baffert's done pretty well bringing horses here to the Pennsylvania Derby and not necessarily always his first stringers. Yeah, Baffert's done well in a lot of big East Coast races, the Pennsylvania Derby being uh, no different. Of course, Byron went on to win a uh, controversial running of the Breeders' Cup Classic out West after winning the Pennsylvania Derby, as you say, about a decade ago, Matt. Uh, Reincarnate is probably a deserving favorite with two stakes that wins this year. Uh, the next horse, who I think is also a possible favorite in here, is Saudi Crown, the number three. Now, Saudi Crown, you, 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 you made point of the fact that there's not a lot of stakes winners in the field, but Saudi Crown has really done quite well in his first four races. Two sprints, uh, two races where he's gone a little bit farther each time. He's run at four different tracks, easy wins at Keeneland and Churchill Downs. And then he just missed in the Dwyer, and then he just missed in the Jim Dandy. Both of them getting beaten just a nose. Yeah, two noses away from uh, having two graded stakes races, uh, and they were uh, certainly uh, certainly against good competition last time in the Jim Dandy. Of course, that was the it was the stretch battle against Forte, and before that, it was in the Dwyer um, Saudi Crown for brad cox is one of the horses in this field that we will have to consider as uh uh well we could call them speed horses but you know they're not 
sprinter type speed horses, but they are horses that prefer to race on the lead or to be very close on the pace. Yeah, that's true, Matt. And especially the two favorites, uh, the two horses I think will buy for favoritism, the 11 reincarnate and the three Saudi crown. Now, Saudi crown, I, I know some th things have been made that he had things all his way, all his own way in the gym dandy, and he still couldn't win. But of course, that was a good field with uh, Forte and Angel of Empire and uh, di uh, Disarm, who ran a big Travers, uh, having finished fourth behind Saudi Crown in that gym dandy. Uh, I, I think it shows he's tactical and he doesn't have to run fast early. And he was, certainly was uh, running well down the stretch, uh, uh, kind of a roughly run stretch where Forte just edged him there. But uh, I thought that was a good performance. And if you want to see Saudi Quran run fast early and, and run well in the stretch, just go back two races because in the Dwyer, he ran 44 and was still, uh, he was actually coming back at Fort Bragg in that one mile Dwyer at Belmont Park. So Saudi Crown in four lifetime races, I think he's looked good to me. And I know Brad Cox is high on this one. A lot of potential for Saudi Crown. Third on the morning line, Matt, is Magic Tap. Magic Tap is uh, is going to be making his stakes debut in this million dollar grade one nine furlong race. It's a tough spot to make your stakes debut, but he looks like a, a, a real developing talent for trainer Steve Asmussen. Yeah, it, it, absolutely, and an interesting horse. If you go, like you said, only four career starts, but if you go back to that first start, which wasn't particularly noteworthy. Uh, for Magic Tap uh, when he finished sixth, except for the fact that the winner of that race just happened to be Saudi Crown. Um, but since then, uh, uh, Magic Tap has certainly done very well, breaking his maiden at Churchill at, at Churchill Downs in his second try, winning an, an allowance at Saratoga quite nicely. Uh, um, yeah. A horse that's got a lot of talent, a son of Tappet. So with a little bit more time, uh, those Tappets tend to get better. But <clears throat> like you said, uh, it's not easy to make your stakes debut in a grade one race, whatever the field looks like. And and this is an experienced field of 11. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It, it might not be full of grade one horses like, say, the Travers was, but there's a lot of talent in this race. It's a deep field. It's not an easy spot. Magic Tap has faced good allowance horses in the last two, but he, he got beat two starts ago, and it, it wasn't exactly an easy winner last time. So he'll need to step up, but he certainly looks like a horse who, who's eligible to step up. Another one that might be eligible to step up, Matt, is the five, Scotland. Uh, Scotland, you know, he's coming off a race that may not look great on paper where he was uh, out there early in the Travers and faded out of it. Uh, but that race two starts ago and, and maybe some races before, he, he looked a little bit like Magic Tap uh, uh, in his form coming from Kentucky, running some good races out here for Trainer Belmont. But that race two, two starts ago was very impressive, winning the Curlin at Saratoga nicely. Uh, Blazing Sevens was third, and Il Miracola came out of a, a second place run in the Curlin to win the local prep for this. So Scotland, to me... If you if you if you understand that the, the Travers may not have been his thing on the lead 12, uh, 10 furlongs and a little bit tougher field, Scotland certainly looks like a horse who's eligible to bounce back. Yeah, I think so, so Brian. Uh, uh, Bill Mott horse. Um, the Travers was run on a track with moisture in it, a muddy track. Um, it, it and we I should note that the uh, weather forecast. Uh, while uh, we're taping on Thursday, so a couple days down the road, is for uh, a pretty rainy day on Saturday down at the parks area. We'll see. I have to see how that plays out. I'm not sure whether it was the muddy track at, in the Travers that had any effect on Scotland or just the pace that you mentioned, but uh, Scotland's an interesting horse to me because uh, we have seen Scotland do well up front pressing the pace on the lead but he also has a nice win from coming off the pace so it's going to be interesting to see it what regular rider junior alvarado does uh in the pennsylvania derby considering that a fast pace is expected we've already mentioned 
the 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 top three favorites are all horses that like to run that way. Uh, what will Mott and Alvarado want to do with Scotland? I think I'd like to see Scotland sit more of a stalking pace in uh, the Pennsylvania Derby. Yeah, I, I think the morning line uh, horses, the two, the two favorites, are the most likely to want the early lead in in, um, in uh, reincarnate the eleven and Saudi Crown. They're pretty split up in the starting gates. So it'll be interesting to see how they uh, break away for the first quarter mile. But then you got horses we've talked about: Magic Tap, Scotland, uh, Il, Il Miracola is uh, uh, shown prominently here on the U.S. Uh, Timeform U.S. Pace Projector. But I, I think all three of them probably will want to sit just a little bit off the two favorites. So, uh, yeah, Scotland being one of them for sure, Matt. You see the fast pace button here on the pace projector, and they're saying uh, Saudi Crown is the fastest of all. We'll see. Reincarnate, lots of speed. I don't think either of them, as you said, they're not sprinter speed, but neither of them absolutely need the lead. So um, a lot could be determined in the first quarter mile of this race. But for me, the most likely leaders are the two favorites, Saudi Crown and Reincarnate. Getting back to the field, Matt, we already mentioned Il Miracola a little bit, the local winner of the Smarty Jones Stakes. Uh, lots of tries and stakes races, not great, but the last two, second to Scotland in the Curlin was an improvement, and then a nice win over the track. Yeah, uh, uh, certainly, I think... Uh... You know, Ear Miracola has gotten back to uh, uh, running good races, being a competitor, being in contention uh, in in his two recent races. Uh, clearly, seems to be more comfortable in Grade Three type races. But like we said, uh, the Pennsylvania Derby may have more of a Grade Three type field. Uh, you know, Ear Miracola. Uh, seems to do his best running closer to the lead. So we'll see what happens with him. Um, I haven't seen who's riding your Mir Il Miracola yet. Uh, um, when um, Scotland was a more of a late minute entry into the field, when he entered, Junior Alvarado, of course, stayed with the Belmont runner and left Il, Il Miracola without a rider. Yeah, we'll, we'll see about those riders. Uh... I guess I like these horses a little bit more than than you or some other people because I, I do feel like there are horses that are more than grade three horses. Even reincarnate the favorite. I, I think, you know, you draw a line through that Kentucky Derby on that fast pace. And I think that's a big excuse for reincarnate. And all his other races have been good. And I think Saudi Crown has the potential to be a very good horse. Maybe Magic Tap in Scotland as well. Uh, Dreamlike Matt, uh, that last race is is a puzzle. I guess he started a little bit slow, but uh, remember back in the Wood Memorial, he was right there as a maiden. He had a nice maiden breaking performance in his return run at Saratoga, and then behind Magic Tap last night, Dreamlike just threw in a, a, a pretty dismal race. If he can bounce back, the past performances look pretty good before that last one. Yeah, absolutely. He has flashed, uh, has flashed some talent. And Brian, you know, we're talking about uh, on the morning line, a Todd Pletcher horse with Irad riding at 10 to 1. You don't get that very often. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it, maybe that means a little bit less to me in a million dollar grade one race. But yeah, you're right, Matt. And, and, and like I said, throw out that last race and becomes a very interesting horse. It's so bad, though, you you got to wonder. Uh, they are changing equipment uh, here with blinkers off of Dream like this time. Uh, Pletcher's other horse is Krupe, who ran in stakes races also as a maiden. Didn't show much with without any speed at all, but now he's come back with two straight wins. Yeah, another interesting kind of horse for Pletcher. I think they were relatively high on this horse. Uh, uh, Mike Rapoli and, and Vinny Viola, St. Elias Stables, uh, own this, uh, own this three-year-old. And uh, it took him a long time to break his maiden. It took eight tries. As you mentioned, some of those, he, he tried some Derby Trail Stakes races as a maiden. Uh, and, and in his early maiden special weights was right there, but just didn't break through. But now, uh, as... Uh, more mature three-year-olds got one, two in a row, um, broke his maiden at Monmouth, and then came to Saratoga to win a nice allowance. Yeah, yeah, maybe he's uh, 
getting some confidence uh, in, in lesser races and is, is ready to make some noise this time in graded stakes. If it if it is wet, like uh, the forecast says, Krupi could be one of the horses, the son of Curlin, who, uh, who doesn't mind a wet track at all. We need to mention Gilmore as well. Uh, we, we talked about Dreamlike having Irad Ortiz Jr. in. Uh, Gilmore gets Johnny Velasquez up. And if you look at Gilmore, you know, he's bounced back a little bit between longer and shorter races. He's run a lot of good stakes races. Uh, he's he's run in big races, most of them uh, shorter than this nine furlong Pennsylvania Derby. But he's run in several good races, and he's run several good performances. He, too, is coming off a win. Yep. Top three uh, finishes in three graded stakes races mixed in there. Of course, Gilmore began his career uh, racing for Bob Baffert. I think it was his first three races uh, uh, uh in the, in California for Baffert, and then he was moved to the barn of Brandon Walsh to uh, as one of those horses uh, looking to qualify for the <clears throat> for the Kentucky Derby when Baffert was was not eligible uh, out in the West. He was second in the El Camino Real Derby. Um, like you said, for Brandon Walsh, has been running shorter but uh, running well, and his last race. Uh, uh, an allowance at Saratoga probably gave them reason enough to take a shot in the PA Derby. Yeah, yeah, kind of like Krupe, but he's he's had much better form in stakes races, and getting that win sometimes gets gives a little confidence to the horses that they can actually uh, win uh, against stakes horses. All right, a big field in the Pennsylvania Derby. We're going to jump right into the Cotillion next map, the three-year-old Philly version. You mentioned that the uh, field in the Pennsylvania Derby was not super uh, uh, accomplished for a grade one race. This field is a little bit more accomplished. And of course, the the favorite on the morning line there, uh, two to one, pretty mischievous being the most accomplished, Matt. Uh, what a nice record she has. As a two-year-old, she was very good. As a three-year-old, she's been better. And uh, she's uh, she's on a roll in grade one races, looking for four straight. Yes, absolutely, Brian. The top of the three-year-old divi- three-year-old Philly division by far, uh, based on those three uh, Grade One wi- uh, victories, uh, starting with the uh, starting with the Kentucky Oaks, and then going up to New York to uh, uh, win the Acorn, and then they cut back in distance a little bit more for the seven furlong test um i like the versatility that uh that pretty mischievous has winning the kentucky oaks around two turns uh uh, with a really impressive performance but then going one turn the last two times uh back to uh uh two turns for this mile and a 16th um a, a very very deserving favorite yeah, she's she's the horse to beat, and she's certainly the horse to beat for the Eclipse Award for three-year-old fillies. Uh, but on the other hand, she's she's not been winning those races by open lengths. Uh, she, they're, they're all photos. And then last time, in fact, she she would have finished second in the test at Saratoga if not for the tragedy of Maple Leaf Mel. But pretty mischievous, just a nice horse. Um, she she's uh, has enough tactical speed to stay in touch early, and then she uh, finishes well. And she certainly knows her, her way to the winner circle. So pretty mischievous. The horse to beat in here, but uh, three straight grade one wins by a photo. I, I wonder if maybe it's time for a loss for pretty mischievous. We'll see. But there's a bunch of interesting fillies in here, Matt. Let's start with the seven defining purpose. This is a Kenny McPeak train filly who's coming out of the 10 furlong Alabama where she was third. She stalked the pace as she normally does. Uh, I think she drops back to a more uh, uh, preferable distance for her. In fact, her two s- recent nice stakes wins, two of the last four, uh, two of the last four races, you're right, defer- Defining Purpose has won at a mile and a 16th. And one of them was the grade one Ashland, the Indiana Oaks being a little bit more recent. Uh, the distance should suit her. Looks like a good pace in here. Defining Purpose certainly is one that you have to consider. 
yeah, I agree that the mile and the 16th distance is a much better spot for defining purpose. Uh, third in the Alabama going a mile and a quarter. Uh, certainly the distance uh, was a factor in there. And then the Kentucky Oaks. Um, uh, yeah, I think this is a much better spot for defining purpose in terms of the distance and and Kenny McPeak uh, you, you never know when his horses are going to pop and win a big one yeah defining purpose three stakes wins grade one winner uh she deserves to be second choice on the morning line the next horse we should talk about Matt is a is a real wild card in in my eyes her name is ceiling crusher ceiling crusher has crushed the field in almost all of her races she's she's only lost once and I guess she had some trouble uh, in a sprint race. So uh, she moved recently from Cal breads to open company. Most of those big wins came against fellow California breads. The last time she was in a grade three at Del Mar open company, obviously. And, uh, she again, romped and showed again that she's a very talented filly. This will be her first time outside of California for trainer Doug O'Neill. She looks like a contender here if she can carry over that good form, but you just don't know how it's going to stack up against these grade one horses. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and those those first four races, uh, she was undefeated in her first four starts against uh, against Calbreds. And I think that nice victory in the Torrey Pines at Del Mar against Open Company was impetus for uh, Doug O'Neill to uh, send uh, Ceiling Crusher to uh, the east to take a shot in the cotillion. Yeah, I know they thought about the test. It looks like she might be better at a, at a distance like this, a mile and a 16th, uh, at least from her past performances. Although she's enjoyed the lead in those big wins and there is other speed in here. Although the time form US pace projector shows that she is the fastest of the fast among the early speed in this race map. There it is, the fast pace button. Once again, both of these races, Ceiling Crusher on the lead, not far behind, Longshot Majestic Creed, Defining Purpose we've already talked about, and Hoosier Philly. And I, and I think Hoosier Philly might be the biggest threat to Ceiling Crusher early, Matt. Hoosier Philly kind of got shuffled back sprinting last time in the Charlestown Oaks. And she looks like one of those horses that if she doesn't have things her own way, she's not that happy. Uh, a bounce back performance certainly could happen for Hoosier Philly. She's working well for trainer Tom Amos. I think she'll show more speed this time at a mile 16th, but you just don't know for sure what you're going to get from her. Yeah, but, the, you know, the the recent race in the uh, Charlestown Oaks uh, on the on the bull ring and, and as you said, that causing not the best of trips it is a race that's easy enough to uh, – uh, give Hoosier Philly uh, plenty of excuse in there. Had a nice win at Ellis Park in the in the Monomoy Girl, and going back a little bit more was second in the Black Eyed Susan, a horse that you know has has flashed flashed some talent, done well in some uh, in some good races, and you know we'll see what happens uh, in the Cotillion. Yeah, and unfortunately this year she looks like a horse who, if if she can be out on the lead and comfortable early, she runs well. She'd be wet paint uh, nicely in, in the Monomoy Girl. She ran a very good race, as you mentioned, in the Black Eyed Susan. But when she's been pressured, she's had trouble. I think, again, I, I said it already, but I think I think they'll have the impetus to send her this time after, after you know being shut off from getting out there on the lead last time at Charlestown. But that pace, again, looks to be strong, Ceiling Crusher and others. So Hoosier Philly might have a tough time against this good field, but she certainly, under Johnny Velasquez, can be part of the pace. One horse we haven't talked about yet, Matt, is a cult. And, and just like Ceiling Crusher, she's coming off a big win. In fact, an even bigger win because she won the grade three Monmouth Oaks by more than 10 lengths. Uh, it, 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 still pretty lightly raced. It occurs to me that a cult is still improving and in her last two she showed the ability to come from a little bit farther off the pace and i think that's helped her and uh, that chad brown runner uh, again with the fast pace scenario um that off the pace uh, running racing style could serve her very well uh in the 
Cotillion uh, won the Monmouth Oaks by romped in the Monmouth uh, Oaks by uh, about 10 lengths. And before that was third uh, in the acorn. It's got a, has a really nice record, uh, Brian. It, it, uh, although not a lot of starts has done really well. The third in the acorn had a fifth in the gazelle in there, but before that was a winner again uh, in the Busanda um, at Aqueduct. So um, an interesting horse, a talented horse, Chad Brown, and you're going to get a Chad Brown here probably as the, I don't know, third choice, fourth choice, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Some decent odds on a cult coming off a big win at Monmouth right. Park. She might be a little bit lower than the six to one with our Rad Ortiz, but uh, there's a lot of horses to bet. So uh, she can't be that low. I just think she's getting better, Matt, and it, it might coincide with being farther off the pace. The Gazelle was early in her career, and she was out there uh, as part of the pace. It looks like she's a better filly developing, getting better, but also a better filly from off the pace. A cult interests me quite a bit in here. Uh, Foggy Knight is the horse that she beat by 10 and a quarter lengths in the Monmouth Oaks. And Foggy Knight won the Delaware Oaks before that start and won the recent Catherine S Sophia over the track. So that race in the Monmouth Oaks was certainly flattered uh, by Foggy Knight, the second place finisher. Uh, another one I want to mention, Matt, who is a little bit interesting to me here is just Catherine. Just Catherine looked a little bit short of this class. Uh, earlier in her career, or certainly when she tried the Gulf Stream Park Oaks. But those two races at Saratoga, I keep looking at those two races at Saratoga but because she's running against good fillies, and she's running well. Um, talk about being flattered. She ran second to randomized two starts back, a good second to randomized. And, of course, randomized came back and won the Alabama. Yeah, and then, and as you said, most recently a nice win uh, in, an al in an allowance race at Saratoga, 12 to 1 on the morning line with Junior Alvarado. Yeah, Junior Alvarado getting aboard this long shot. And as we've already mentioned, so many horses to bat so much class in this race. Just Catherine should be double digits on the morning line. Uh, that's our look at both the Pennsylvania Derby and Cotillion, Matt. Uh, good fields. Um, We'll, we'll say it again. I think they're decent betting races. Hopefully that's more luck than last week when they were decent betting races and Matt's and I picks did not get it done. We're going to try to rebound here with some better picks. And Matt, I'm going to let you go first with our top pick segment. Pennsylvania Derby first. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for letting me go first, Brian. Uh, um, a field of 11, a lot of interesting contenders. Uh, we talked about the merits of Scotland um, in our rundown for the race. Scotland is going to be my top pick for Bill Mott. Um, uh, I, we've seen the talent. Uh, if we are willing to uh, give an excuse for per the performance in the Travers, which was in a stellar stellar grade one quality field. Um, Scotland is a horse to me that is on the upward swing. Yeah. And the odds might not reflect that because he's coming off a, a pretty good loss, a pretty good beating, if you will, in the Travers. And he's going from grade $1 million race to another grade $1 million race. And I, I do think Scotland's very interesting because if he runs back to that curl and two starts ago, I think he's a horse who has a threat in here and he might still be getting better for trainer Bill Mott. Sometimes a mile and a quarter against that type of competition, you get a little discouraged by the 316th fall or so. And that happened to Scotland in the Travers, but I don't think that's a huge negative as he actually gets an easier field this time in the grade one million dollar race. However, for me, I just think Saudi Crown is a really good horse. I, I'm convinced that he's uh, more than a grade three type. Um, yeah, he, he was the only speed in the Jim Dandy and he lost by a nose, but Great field in the Jim Dandy, and again, he was so game in the stretch, just like he was in the Dwyer. Uh, I think he's a horse developing into a grade one quality horse for trainer Brad Cox. I, I said before, he's high on him, and I, and I can see why. And I, Saudi Crown has to be my pick in here. It'll be interesting, as I said, what happens the first quarter mile of that race. But I think Saudi Crown is a horse who can sit second if he needs to or take the lead if he wants it. And uh, he's he's my horse to beat in the Pennsylvania Derby. How about the Cotillion now? Hey, Brian, I'm a big fan. Um, I've 
been a big fan of pretty mischievous heading into the Kentucky Oaks and, and, and continuing to win. I know, uh, uh, it's tough to keep winning, but uh, uh, I think uh, Pretty Mischievous is a very talented uh, three-year-old filly and a good competitor. I'm going with the favorite in this race. A good competitor, to be sure. Three straight photo finish wins in grade one company. Will she get a fourth? I'm going to try to beat her. I'm going to try to beat her. I will include her because you have to include her. And, and tactically and, and the way she fights down the stretch, she is to so tough. But I like a cult. I, I think you got the feeling of that listening to me talk about a cult in the cotillion. I think she's moving in the very much in the right direction. I think she gets a nice pace set up here. And uh, in the acorn, she got off to a stumbling start. And that cost her a little bit when pretty mischievous beat her. I think a cult can turn the table two starts later. She's my pick. And I'm hoping we get something like six to one in the cotillion. All right, now jam-packed grade one racing uh, preview sh uh, show here. We're only six weeks away from the Breeders' Cup, my friend. we got to start talking more Breeders' Cup. Next week, there's big preps on both coasts. That's what we'll be focusing on, Horse Center. But for now, I want to get a parting shot from you, my good friend. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Brian. Um, I will be at the Pennsylvania Derby on Saturday. I hope that the weather holds out. I hope we have good weather. Uh, I know I've seen Horse Center fans in the past uh, uh, at the big day at, at parks. So uh, if you see me wandering around, say hello. I used to hang out at parks all the time when I was a young man. Uh, me, me and my dad mostly at parks and have good memories from i remember when broad brush looked like he was going to run into the grandstand in the pennsylvania derby and he still won that I i'm thinking that was about 37 years ago now boy oh boy time flies uh broad brush there are no broad brushes in this field but uh two interesting races at parks and other stakes to boot good night folks i hope you enjoyed the show good luck this week we'll see you right here next week on horse center